afternoon. My name is Ben Greenfield. I'm the Director of Marketing at Helmer Scientific. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Utilizing Lean Concepts to Implement Refrigerated Medication Safety. Please feel free to submit questions during the webinar using the questions pane on your screen. We'll have time to answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation. All slides that will be shown this afternoon are posted for download in the webinar, webinar software. The link is listed above the questions pane on your screen. We will also send a follow-up email that will include a link to this presentation. I am very pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Jessalyn Henney, PharmD. Dr. Henney currently serves as the Medication Safety Director at Community Health Network in Indiana. Through multidisciplinary teams, Dr. Henney oversees the strategic management of medication safety for both acute care and ambulatory care services, focusing on all steps of the medication use process. In addition, she co-chairs the Indianapolis Coalition for Patient Safety Medication Safety Workgroup and is a member of the ICPS Contrast Media and Executive Workgroups. Without further delay, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Dr. Henney. Thank you for that introduction. Before beginning, we'd like to be able to talk about um, disclosures real quickly. Um, just bringing over to attention to our right-hand side, um, are the presented examples and pictures are for educational purposes only and do not represent Community Health Network. All the provided examples will be de-identified to, to help um, with privacy. And last but not least, many of these examples contain non-medical grade refrigerator units. Excessive temperature exposures can reduce potency of certain medications and to help mitigate this risk, it is recommended to store in a medical grade unit. Overview of this presentation, we've broken this down into three different sections. The first one, reviewing potential risk. Our second one is mitigation strategies. And our third one is being able to combine this together, utilizing lean methodology to improve um, organization and safely store these um, refrigerated medications. For our intended audience today, so I've broken this down to six different areas, but really it is, to simplify it, it's one of those where do you store medications that are refrigerator, or are you involved within um, lean projects? So as you can see here, um, that's uh, broken them down to six different ones, but this can be really for anybody, um, for those seeking a potential project, to those that, are, um, that have this responsibility of refrigerated medications within their job. The other thing I wanted to mention was the scope of this presentation. As uh, we all know here, refrigerated medication storage is very complex. Um, I've broken this down to three different areas, the outside, more of the equipment, the temperature monitoring, and last but not least, the inside or organization. And as you can see, that is where within the green box, that is what our scope of this presentation will be for today. First, we'll look through um, the potential risk affiliated with refrigerator medications. Before diving into refrigerator medication specifically, let's talk about uh, medication air occurrences um, throughout the whole med use process. So this is actually um, dated back 1995, um, Leap et al., this is his study, and they talk about the different airs that were noted and um, how frequently they were intercepted. As you can see here with dispensing, while it is a lower percentage compared to, say, administration or prescribing, but it is noted that with um, only 33% are actually caught. That means 66% of errors that are from the dispensing process would actually reach the patient. Meaning that we should be able to, we need to put mitigation strategies in because those that do occur are very unlikely to be caught. Factors that are influencing medication errors, the World Health Organization has identified seven different factors. I've only listed five here, and those that would be contributing to the refrigerator medication storage. And so these are important to keep in mind um, when we are determining potential solutions to reduce the risk of errors associated with refrigerator medications. When looking at risk and safety information, I'd like to be able to break this down into two different um, sources. The first one is literature, so um, items within PubMed, these are things that are published. Um, and the other one is voluntary reporting. And this would be both internally within organizations and also externally, those are with reported to the FDA or ISMP. 
So what do we know within this? So within our literature, um, it does support general concepts that refrigerator medication storage can lead to patient harm if done um, incorrectly. Also, there are factors associated with injection use and that storage and, and can, um, incorrect storage can lead to errors affiliated with that. And there's also studies focusing on optimizing our automated dispensing cabinets in general, not necessarily refrigeration though. And so what do we not know? There's not much in literature that talks about specifically refrigerator medication storage. They might add it into other studies, but not necessarily truly um, focusing and diving in within depth of that. Within voluntary reporting, um, depending on how your system is set up and how voluntary reports come in, you may have may be easily able to capture this information. You may not be able to. What there is information on is several case studies that um, have been demonstrated severe harm. And the other thing is we're not really able to understand the scope due to underreporting of errors. So I'm sure every time you get a phone call from a nurse that says, where's my medication? That's not documented or reported within your organization. So there's probably a lot of underreporting. And so we're not truly understanding the scope of this problem. So we do know a few um, reported case studies. So I wanted to mention these three. The first one is neuromuscular blockers. So it has been noted that ISMP, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, has received over 100 reports concerning accidental administration of neuromuscular blockers. And even though these have dated back to 1996, and there's actually been a best practice, number seven, that has been established focusing on storage, there continues to be documented events. Many of these are due to unsafe storage or inadequate labeling. And those that are reported examples are um, accidentally using neuromuscular blockers to reach constitute vaccines. And also many times there's a mistake between hepatitis B or influenza vaccines with neuromuscular blockers. Our second case study will bring us to um, the ISMP Brazil um, issued alert. And this actually happened in 2016, where a nurse responsible for um, get, providing the flu shot actually administered to over 50 employees um, insulin instead of the flu vaccine. It was noted that they were under observation for 12 hours after receiving um, glucose injections, but no adverse effects were noted. And our third report is also through uh, 2016 published a newsletter through ISMP, and they discussed the various dangers reported due to unsafe um, vaccine um, storage. These reported examples are a little bit more in detail, so they do talk about selecting the wrong vaccine, diluent, or other medication, especially those that are look like sound alikes. Um, talking about unsegregated storage that has led to dispensing and administration, the wrong vaccine or wrong vaccine form. And these are those that are specifically for adult versus pediatric, and last but not least, accidental product mix up So as we know here, it is recognized that refrigerator storage has a lot of unique challenges. So those might be limited space, lacking built-in discrete pockets or bins, storing different types of product products, and a different manufacturer recommendations that are out there. ISMP has identified several common contributing factors regarding drug storage errors, which I've included here below. Many of those are with, noted within those unique challenges, um, such as crowded shelves, lack of dividers, and that's because of the lack of built-in discrete pockets or bins. Last but not least, another area that contributes to errors is human factors. When it comes to stock retrieval, this is a process that is wired automatically within, within us. This task is performed unconsciously or from a force of habit. It requires little or no effort to reach inside the bin and grab what is in there. Many times, it is, um, it is one of those that this isn't caught until barcode administration occurs that we recognize the error has really occurred. So this is why it's important to have a process that allows for us to store and being able to reduce the risk of errors when we are stocking the machine because those that are utilizing it on the back end may not recognize this until it's too late. As I like to say, garbage in equals garbage out. When it's something put in correctly, it will most likely be taken out incorrectly. And this is why we need to des design a process with the end user in mind to prevent errors. 
So now we've talked about what risks are involved. I'm sure, as you know, I didn't tell you anything new. I'm sure you see this within your own organizations, but wanted to provide what background information I was able to find, as well as what has been seen in practice. And so as we know, this is a risk that we've seen within our own hospitals or within our own areas. And so let's be able to identify risk strategies. And so for that, I've divided that into general concepts and as well as specifically looking over high risk medications. First, we'll talk about our general concepts. For our first part of this, we'll talk about space allocation. I will have, um, I'll have you guys looking at slide 21 in a second, but right now we'll look at slide 18, and then I'll have you look at 21 while talking about the helpful tips. So the first thing, as you see here, there's a fridge picture on the right here, and uh, you open this up, and I'm sure everyone was shocked <laughs> to see we've got red bins stored on others. We've got medications not even in a bin. We have empty bins. And so there's not a lot of, the numbers are out of order. There's not a lot of organization at all to this picture. And so it's very important that all storage areas, including the shelves, narcotic boxes, bins, and patient designated areas are adequately sized and avoid clutter. Stock should be well spaced and easily visible. So when this, just in this refrigeration, there are actually three neuromuscular blockers. You only see the two red bins there. In the back is actually a third one that you don't see. So yes, this fridge does have three neuromuscular blockers in it. You just can't see it because it's so far in the back. Um, this is a good example of why needing to be able to have things well spaced and easily visible. This was where people would dra grab the wrong neuromuscular blocker because they didn't recognize that a third one was in the back that they really needed. The other thing is do not overstack the bins, and it's best to store away from the floor, coils, walls, ceiling to allow for proper air circulation. And this is, um, even though this is where it's wanting to be able to space everything evenly, it is recommended to check with the manufacturer for specific requirements. It is also recommended to ensure to include enough space for your largest inventory requirements, so for example, if you store flu vaccines only, what is the largest supply needed within flu season for your flu vaccines? This is the amount of space that would be needed for your particular refrigeration unit. The other thing to keep in mind is what is your future capacity requirement? Do you suspect another unit will be using this refrigerator, requiring for more inventory to be inside of it? These are the things to keep in mind when thinking about how much space would be needed to store so that we don't have, as you can see in this top shelf here, bins stored on top of each other. So I will have you guys go to slide 21 as I talk about um, the space allocation helpful tips, being able to apply it within the picture here. So the first thing is ensuring the bins are stored to allow easy retrieval, as we talked about, and making sure we don't stack upon each other. Also, patient room bins located on a shelf that's easier to reach. So as you can see here on the second shelf, you have um, a bunch of you have the four bins there. Those are patient-specific bins that were not really used. It, better, it would be better for them to be stored on the bottom shelf so that when they are in, so that they would be able to be other medications can be on that shelf that are more frequently used. The other idea to keep in mind is to ensure the, are the appropriate bin sizes. So those four bins there are very large. Maybe it'd be better to have smaller bins because we don't have products that are that big inside them. So we can utilize that space for other areas. The other idea is making sure that we actually have a bin for everything. As you can see on the right hand on the top arrow, that's actually a medication in a plastic bag that was just kind of placed there. And so this medication would be probably considered lost and having a phone call down to pharmacy of figuring out where the medication is. The other thing to keep in mind is strategically placing items within the unit to avoid mix-ups and so things aren't just thrown into the fridge. Also, being able to obtain proper or strategically place these based upon the user perspective and acquiring feedback. So should that top shelf be um, emergency medication so that they're easily grabbed? Is it one of those that um, these are the medications that are most frequently used so that they're not bending down all the time to grab them? These are things that will help with organization so that medications aren't just thrown into the back. The other thing is do not store personal items. While this picture does not have any personal items in there, there are many times where you might see orange juice. Just because it's treating hypoglycemia for patients, it cannot be in the same fridge as our medications. The other thing to think about is storing medications required for that area. 
So what are the patient-specific care needs for that population? What is the expertise or familiarity of staff with those medications? And what potential air risk due to other medications stored within there that might be able to be foreseen? When it comes to empty bins, medication versus non-standard stock and versus having a, your standard stock versus non-standard stock. So as you can see in the bottom left hand in the arrow, that was an empty bin. The reason why that was empty was because the medication that was loaded was a, it was labeled as a standard stock, but there really wasn't anything to fill in there, and the bin was never removed. And the last time that was actually filled was about four months prior to. The other thing to keep in mind is developing a process to regularly review these stock items, as mentioned, non-standard stock versus your standard stock, as well as ensuring that there are your soon to expired or expired medications are removed, reviewing your PAR levels for usage to ensure that the bin sizes match appropriately, and utilizing the same techniques to optimize the automatic dispensing cabinets can be used within this as well. The next thing to think about is with our standardization. So when it's in this picture here, we got um, on our left here, these are products that are not facing the same direction. So it may be confusing, are which ones are expired, which ones are not. The, within the box on the right, this one is not organized in a logical fashion. We actually have medications in the back that are a different strength and a different product than what is currently up front. These become lost and may, not, and may expire not given to the patient in time. The other thing to think about is first in, first out when it comes to standardization and developing a process that allows for that. Also limiting and standardizing your oral and IV concentrations so that we don't have you know, 20 different strengths in there, but maybe just one or two. Our next factor to keep in mind is segregation. So a lot of times we'll have products that are look like sound alike stored next to each other, and this is a big um, area that can cause an error. So reviewing your ISMP list as well as your site-specific list, implementing tall man lettering, and also thinking about the frontline user so we do not confuse when stocking or dispensing. Also separating your expired meds from active products. The other thing to keep in mind is separating products with different administration routes. So re making sure you have a separate area for medications that are nebulized versus intravenous, oral, et cetera. Other products in the refrigeration um, that should be segregated are your food and drink, as mentioned, the orange juice and testing supplies. Sometimes testing supplies may be in there and that's in the same unit, but having a dedicated separate shelf to help prevent mix-ups. Also, it is recommended that patient-specific medications within a separate area as well, as well, similar to the testing supplies, not necessarily separate unit, but separate shelves to be able to help separate where those medications are located, as well as your high alert medications. When it comes to labeling, it is recommended to attach the shelves and containers and include the name and the strength, the, and also indications that can help provide product differentiation. So with vaccines, it might be adult versus pediatric. Implementing consistent spacing with the drug name and strength, being free of unapproved abbreviations, and making sure that we follow our policies. So for example, I'm sorry, can you please go back, sorry. So for example, I have the Novolog, and so with this would be consistent spacing. So making sure there's a space after the Novolog, after the 100, but no space between the units and the mill. But, but we also have tall man lettering as well as un no unapproved abbreviations. So making sure that you would have a consistency within the standard, standardized format within your labels for all of your medications. Also with labeling, I always, when it comes to stickers, I'm sure stickers are something that, you know, it's kind of an extra added feature when you dispense your medications. Um, but one of the things I always recommend is having a sticker that is affiliated with a positive action. So when it comes to these below, you have, it's recommended to have refrigerate. This affiliates with a positive action. We're going to be doing something with it. Versus if you place a do not refrigerate or store at room temperature, these can be misleading and cause confusion on proper storage. Many times nurses see do not refrigerate and they really read it as refrigerate and they place the medication in the fridge. And so it is recommended to only have stickers that are just, they just say refrigerate versus the other two because these are affiliated with an actual positive action that needs to occur because of the sticker. 
Next, we'll talk about vaccines. And so when it comes to vaccines, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of errors that are noted within this particular class of medications. And so I've pulled here, of, these are the various ones within storage, handling, administration, and overall. And the ones that are highlighted have been, a, hopefully through this presentation, you'll be able to address these. So in our first general concepts, um, before diving into this, I want you guys to recognize that each state program may be slightly different and to make sure that you review your state program requirements um, so, because to make sure you are compliant. As being said though, overall these should be general concepts that would be for any um, state program. The first thing is to never store different vaccines in the same bin or container, even if they are you know, the same type, maybe for different um, adults versus pediatrics, you would still want individual bins for each one of those. The next is to store vials in the original packaging with the lid closed within a label designated storage container and should never have loose bins or manufacture filled syringe outside of their packaging. This is to help them to protect from light, as well as making sure that there are less confusion or mix ups. The next thing is to store vaccines within their corresponding diluents, so making sure that they are next to each other. And also to remind staff that the, these vaccines do have two components so that they have not missed the need to, to util, utilize the diluents before administering the medication. Also, bins should indicate the appropriate age range for the vaccine administration. The next thing is thinking about expiration dates. So how many times have you opened up the refrigerator and have seen expired medications and you're wondering how did that even, how did it not get caught till three months later? And so one of those things is making sure to educate staff to ensure they have an understanding of expired medication dates and how to appropriately read the vials. So as you can see here on the bottom of the screen, you have two different vials. The first one has the expiration of August 16th of 2019. On the right, it just says, you know, 819 or August 2019. There is a difference between those. So as you can see here on the left, it says do not use on or after August 17th, but on the right, you can use through the whole month and it would be not to use on September, on September 1st. The other thing to think about is making sure your stock is rotated, as mentioned previously, first in, first out, and to check for these expired doses regularly. It's recommended to have a designated person to make sure this is actually completed at least once a week or, or when receiving vaccine delivery. The other thing is to keep in mind of what, how big is the font? And so it should be, the expiration date should be standardized and displayed so it enhances readability. And it's recommended to consider a minimum of size 12. When it comes to product differentiation, it is recommended to separate and store vaccines according to vaccine type and formulations mentioned before. Pediatric vaccines, one way to designate them and to make sure they are differentiated is by storing them in a pink bin. If pink bins are not available, you can always, I mean, I have done this before, taking a pink highlighter to the label and making sure that their color pink is on the label. It would be recommended to have a pink bin, but understanding that supplies may not be readily available. The other thing to help differentiate is your private versus public stock and having these being separated so that they are easily retrieved and they minimize the door time to hopefully have less temperature fluctuations when the door is open. Last but not least, separating your lookalike sound alike vaccines and making sure they are not stored on the same shelf. So as you can see, the two different types here, DTAP and DTAP and TDAP, <laughs> as well as our HIV, H and Hep B vaccines, and having these separated. A one way to help mitigate with this is to utilize manufactured pre-filled vaccines, but do not draw up do doses and create your own pre-filled vaccines. These would need to be from the manufacturer. It is recommended to only draw up vaccines during the time of administration. When it comes to vaccines, the first choice to have is actually to store them in a separate location and to have a designated pharmacy grade unit or purpose build unit that has only vaccines stored within them. While this may not be feasible, especially due to space constraints, it is second choice would be best, which is to store vaccines on a different shelf from other products included in the unit. CDC recommends that the lower shelf is used for other products. Storage location is vital to ensure product potency, especially with vaccines, which are very sensitive to temperature fluctuations. 
As you can see with this graph here, this is a temperature monitoring system. On the left is the non-medical grade fridge, and you can see that there are wide ranges of temperature fluctuations. On the right, once a medical grade fridge was implemented to store, you can see that there's a much tighter um, temperature fluctuations, And so this was able to reduce the potential for vaccines stored to have temperature excursions. And this should reinforce the purpose of storing centrally within a unit or also having a medical grade fridge to store these medications. A good resource that, is, that can be utilized to help with vaccine storage and handling is the January 2018 um, CDC toolkit. Our, the last time it was published was in June 2016, so if you've not heard, January this month they published a new one, and I wanted to provide a good picture here that helps explain the different, the different recommendations for the location within the fridge. This is a great handout or great toolkit to utilize within your own facility. So here's an example of vaccine storage before, and the next slide will be after. But as you can see with the before picture, there were two different units holding both vaccines and diabetic medications. Bins were not utilized within the vaccine and within the diabetic fridge. Um, products were not facing the same direction. It was hard to identify expired medications or if selecting the correct product. Also, there was orange juice stored within those medications as well. And the other thing was medications were stored in this bottom drawer, as you can see here, which were easily lost. Actually, those were identified as expired meds once the fridge was being cleaned out. After implementation, they actually separated and made sure that vaccines had their own separate fridge and the diabetic supplies were stored in the second fridge. As you can see here, labeled unit one and label two. Pink bins were used to indicate pediatric vaccines. Bins with standardized label formatting were implemented to make sure there was consistent spacing and no unapproved abbreviations. Blue stickers indicated that there was supply for vaccine for children and they were actually stored separately in the bottom part of the fridge there, and separate from the other supply. The other thing was they included extra bins that they knew additional products were going to be added in to ensure there was dedicated space so that they were able to easily implement them or be able to easily store them within the fridge. The next concept we'll talk about is controlled substances. So within controlled substances, one of the major things it is is to make sure it is um, for sure locked up to prevent diversion. So as you can see here, here's a picture of a lock box that contains a controlled substance, which the key is accessed through the automatic dispensing cabinet, and this would be on a blind count to ensure that they're able to make, to ensure that the keys were able to have um, your chain of custody and knowing who was able to, who's able to pull them out of the automated dispensing cabinet. Another idea that has been seen out there is having a second fridge designated to only store controlled substances only. The other recommendation is to review your site policy to ensure that you, what is happening in practice aligns with your policy. So for example, ensure that your definitions match to your practice. So for double lock, the concept of, this concept of double lock. So if the room containing the medication storage is not locked at all times, then that means your refrigerator unit must be locked at all times and the controlled substance must be locked within that unit to have a double lock. A lot of times medications that are stored in the fridge may not be in a locked room. And so it's important to ensure that, you're, that you are follow, following your policies. Our next, med our next medication will be insulin. And for this one, it's important to have product differentiation, both insulin types and concentrations. This can be done through auxiliary labels and barcode administration when you are dispensing as well as stocking the medications. And more specifically with U500 insulin, to make sure this is stored within a bin, prefer, preferably lidded, and located in a separate location of, from other insulin products. Vials should be stored only within the pharmacy and not on patient care units, and that it is dispensed patient-specific doses to the floors. Also, do not dispense or store insulin vials in cartons on patient care units. This is because it has been mixed up before when a nurse or another user puts back the insulin and they may put into the wrong pocket. The next person who comes by may only read the carton and not the actual vial. Then this is where an incorrect product may be administered. 
our next, our next class will be neuromuscular blockers. This is actually an ISMP best practice number seven, which was published 2016, and they've actually um, revised this for their newest version, 2018-2019 targeted best practices, which states to segregate, sequester, and differentiate all neuromuscular blocker agents from other medications wherever they are stored in the organization. Here below is a graph, results from an ISMP conducted survey to determine compliance and barriers of this best practice. As you can see here over time, more people are becoming fully compliant. But as you can see, it's been taking some time for this to occur. Some of the reported barriers through this survey were space limitations, as well as the anesthesia ADC is an open matrix, and allowing not for segregation in the OR workstations. Some compliance ideas are to include a red lidded bin, including a sticker, segregate and distinguish each product if multiple stored in the same fridge, so standardizing the different vial sizes that are stored. So making sure that, um, let's say, all rocaronium are 10 mil vials versus having five and 10 mil vials, but then having your succicoline vials all five. So if you standardize your different sizes of vials, this may help to distinguish between different products. Also, utilizing different dispensing containers. So maybe you say, we're going to dispense all rock and vials, but all succicoline and syringes. This will also help to differentiate your different products. As mentioned before, ISMP had this revised. In the green here, you can see the areas that they changed and revised this best practice. The one area to take note of as the exception is, this now excludes anesthesia prepared syringes of neuromuscular blocking agents. The other thing to take note of is the sticker that they recommend to put on there. And it now recommends to say patients must be vented to clearly communicate that, res that respiratory paralysis will occur and ventil ventilation is required. So here's an example of medications for neuromuscular blockers. And as you can see here, medications were not securely stored in the red lidded bin on the left. And also the sticker does not align with ISMP revised best practice. With the picture on the right, as you can see, there were actually, you can kind of see there that with the orange there, there are other medications right next to these, and it's, so it's not segregated. Also, these were not stored into a bin. So now that I've rattled off all these different concepts, they're very one-off, and you're probably recognizing, oh, I need to probably implement these within my hospital. It's one of those that can become very overwhelming. And so how can you implement these within your organization? One of the concepts that is great to utilize in implementing is the principles of 5S. And so 5S is a common tool used to organize a workspace and incorporates visual order, organization, cleanliness, and standardization. And the goal is to allow the process users every time to have the materials they need, where they need it, and when they need it. And so benefits include improved safety and quality, increased visual management, increased productivity, decreased waste and costs. It also boosts morale, especially when you have a frontline user being able to implement this project and being able to become yellow belt or green belt certified, as well as improve your company image. As you can see here, there are five different steps within the 5S process. Sort, set, shine, standardize, and sustain. The first step is sort. This is where we only want to keep necessary items and remove all others. The next is set, wanting to arrange these items to promote an efficient workflow. Next is shine, being able to clean the area, making sure that we have proper bins that are with, with the right labels, no grime, making sure everything's cleaned up. Next is standardize, making sure we have everything in a set place every time it's the same way. And last is sustain, so making sure that our improvements will be maintained over time. So let's go back to our neuromuscular blocker project that you've seen before within our last slide. So here as you can see, here's some of the pictures from beforehand. And now let's see if we can do this with our 5S. So as you can see on slide 46, we have our 5S, we have our 5S technique for the neuromuscular blockers. And so it was recognized an increase of errors affiliated with neuromuscular blockers and a 5S project was put onto this to improve the dispensing and stocking and storage process within these medications. The first one was sort. 
So this is where the removal of pancuronium from formulary. This has been on shortage for a while, and this actually has not been ordered from this particular organization for about three to four years. So it was recommended to remove it from formulary. The next was to remove clinical un clinically unnecessary neuromuscular blockers and ensuring that those stored in there were relevant for the patient population. Next was to set it. So reorganize each unit and place medications in a logical order. Next was shine. So ensuring all neuromuscular blockers are placed in a red lidded bin. This was also within the pharmacy as well and optimize the PAR levels. When it comes to the red lidded bins, many times the bins that were already in place, the lids were removed, the labels were halfway pulled off. This was a great opportunity within Shine to ensure that the labels were nice, clean, and fresh, as well as the lids were not cracked and making sure that everything was nice and neat. Next was standardize. So making sure that the bin labels were formatted the same, the vial sizes throughout the automated dispensing cabinets were the same for each medication, as well as making sure that the location within the unit where they stored was standardized as well. Next was sustain. So within this organization, a policy was created to ensure a maximum of three neuromuscular blocker types were stored within each automatic dispensing cabinet and also educating pharmacy and nursing on the importance of having this organized. So within that, you would think, I wanna keep everything in order. <laughs> But this is actually, you can't just sometimes do sword, set, shine in that exact same order, especially when you have to go to meetings, you have to go to P&T to get approval with a policy. And so this was actually the order that was done. So it wasn't all necessarily sort at one, shine, and so on and so forth. So you can see here the different steps that were required and the comments on the right of what action was completed. And because of the different um, being able to implement through the whole hospital, that's why not everything was in the row. I will say, though, sustain was the last three steps to ensure that everything was completed beforehand and we would sustain our optimal state. So here are pictures for final results. We have before for our pick you and after. So this, the before picture was what you saw earlier in our space allocation, and this is now afterwards. You can see the numbers are all in a row, nice and neat. You have medications on the top that are more frequently used. This was from nursing request. We have our neuromuscular blockers nice and neatly on the right in the same air row, cisatricurium, then rocaronium, and then succicoline in that air in the same way. Other units, would have those in the same order as well, having cisatricurium before rock and then sucks on the bottom. You can see here we actually have additional space underneath the lockbox and actually on that second to bottom row, we actually have additional space so that we can now have extra bins if, some, if we have a new medication needing to be stored in there. So as you can see from going use, utilizing 5S, we're able to organize this in a fashion actually create more space. Our next picture is also utilizing that same concept. So on the right, or our left side, we have our before for the cardiac ICU. In this particular picture, there were actually two, uh, two neuromuscular blockers stored there. Um, one of them is actually on a bag on the bottom shelf next to the testing supplies. Um, the other one was in the back. And then as you can see here on the right is the organized, um, being able to have this all organized. So with our assessment questions, we're going to have you guys being able to utilize these concepts. So for this, um, pic or for this picture here, I've pointed out the positive. So we have pro-quad pro that is kept in different color bins from the other um, vaccines shown here. Supply source is separated, so you, that's the top shelf versus the bottom shelf. The bins are allowing adequate airflow as well as the vaccines and manufactured box inside a labeled bin. So I will now ask you and give you a couple minutes to decide and write them down. Um, we will ch uh, next slide will be able to check yourself. And so there are six opportunities that we'll be able to identify. Three of them have been related to this and other three were additional items not necessarily discussed in this presentation, but a great opportunity to learn about. So I will give you guys a minute. Well, I'm sure that you guys have thought about it. No, it's not officially a minute, but we'll keep going to the next slide. And I'm sure with the slides, you'll be able to see the next one. We'll have here, so the improvements. The yellow ones were the ones that were the three officially with organization. The orange ones are those affiliated with additional bonus, we'll call them. So 
the first one is improvement, stacked bins. As you can see on the left here, we have vaccines that are stored on top of each other. Also, the ProQuad should have a pink label to indicate for pediatrics. The random vial not in the bin um, and protect, oh sorry, the next one would be the random vial not in the bin that protects from light down at the bottom um, shelf. The orange ones, we have the frost indicating temperature is too cold. The cup um, with the penny inside of it, this is actually not a reliable monitoring technique, so please do not do that. And last but not least, it is recognized that this refrigerator unit is not medical grade and it has vaccines stored within it, which is another area of opportunity. So you've heard about all these great concepts. You've identified opportunities within your site. You've learned about how other, area, how other sites have implemented with the concept of lean. And so what are your next steps? So I've broken this down to two different areas. So you've got current work sustainment as well as project implementation. Maybe you have some work that's already been completed or maybe you're starting at square one. We'll first start with current work sustainment. So the first thing is, making sure you've created a guideline, policy, or standard operating procedure to help limit the types of medications, multiple concentrations, or maximum quantities that are stored within the refrigeration unit. Also, high alert medications, making sure that they are segregated and stored within a lidded bin. It is, as I mentioned before, the CDC 2018 um, toolkit contains necessary, co necessary concepts to include within your standard operating procedure. Also, this is a great opportunity to include within unit inspections or looking for expiration products, as well as staff education. One thing to use for staff education has been the CDC. There is no reason to create your new, brand new resources when you can utilize the CDC resources that are already provided. So here's another one, that, and this is actually one of theirs, and so it says, how many vaccine storage opportunities can you identify? So give you guys a couple seconds to think about those, and we'll display them on the next slide. So as you can see, there are eight storage areas of opp opp opportunity contained within this picture. This is actually one of the CDC education materials that you can utilize with your staff as well to help them understanding the importance of the understanding of refrigeration storage. So let's say this is brand new to you, and this is a lot of great opportunities. So where's a great place to start? So I always recommend students and residents. This is a great project to delegate to someone else and being able to check in with them, as well as anyone searching for a Yellow Belt project or Green Belt project. Also, ensuring that all users involved in the process are included, so medical assistants, nurses, technicians. Also, start with your high alert medications and determine your scope. So as I mentioned, voluntary reporting may not be the best way to determine your scope size. So how large or small of an issue this is within your facility. Other ways you can gather data to determine this may be tracking your phone calls of where is my medication, reviewing your automatic dispensing cabinet data, barcode administration data. So how many times was a nurse informed that they had the wrong med and it was identified through scanning. Also, when it comes to compounding and technology used within this, how many times was rework needing to be done when compounding products due to the incorrect product selection? When it comes to quick implementation, I wanted to provide everyone a list of those that would be just quick and easy things you can do to today. You can leave this presentation, you can now um, hand this over to someone and have this be a quick check for you. So these would be ideas that these should be quick implementations. Um, so ensure all medications are stored within a bin or label. I always recommend for for you to physically go see the unit. You never know when you open up the refrigerator, refer, refrigerator what you will physically find inside of it. <laughs> also include tall man lettering and ensure lack of inappropriate abbreviation and labels. Utilizing the CDC created materials to educate staff. Separating your loss of medications and standardizing locations. Also within vaccines, place all of your pediatric vaccines in a pink bin or use a pink label. As mentioned, sometimes even just taking a highlighter will help as well. Separate your um, loss of vaccines as well and ensure the diluents are stored next to each other and um, to the vaccine. For U500 insulin, ensure this is stored in a red lidded bin and it's separated from where other, vac other, in from where other insulin products are stored within the fridge. And do not store the vials on patient care units. Last but not least, for neuromuscular blockers, making sure that all of them are stored in a red lidded bin. Thank you so much for, pre for uh, this presentation and um, any questions that you have.
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Henney, for sharing your presentation with our audience today. We are now ready to move to questions and answers. As a reminder for our participants, please submit your questions using the questions pane on your screen. If we don't have time for all submitted questions, we will make sure to follow up after the webinar. Um, so we're going to take a look here and see. So the first question for Dr. Henney is, what are some of the ways you have collaborated with nursing and other clinical teams outside the pharmacy to implement recommendations? That's a great question. When it comes to working, this is a great, um, as mentioned before, making sure you incorporate the end user. So making sure you ask what is the best location for them, especially with nursing that, or medical assistants that may be um, retrieving the medications from the refrigerator, what is the best location? Also, making sure we educate them to reinforce the importance of maintaining organization that has been completed, as well as expiration dates. Making sure we talk to our, the people that are stocking the refrigeration, refrigerator of not just, as I like to say, just throwing things in the fridge. They should be placed in a bin the same way every time and that they are standardized to make sure that the expiration date is easily seen. Also, other education tips would be to um, and making sure to explain why there are different color bins or tall man lettering or why the dealer are just stored next to each other to provide purpose to the mitigation strategies that are in place. Other ways I've um, been able to work with um, other healthcare providers has been with the physicians to look over their prescribing practices to ensure that they are, act, you know, so when it comes to our RSI, are they really using the appropriate medications? And this, this is the only reason why they need a neuromuscular blocker on the unit, then they shouldn't be having other neuromuscular blockers that are not indicated for RSI within that fridge, and they would be supplied by pharmacy. So this is how I've been able to work with others outside of the pharmacy department to implement these concepts. Great, thank you. The, the next question um, relates directly to lean. Uh, what is the best way to maintain or sustain improvements in safety and organization after initial implementation and training? Another great question. So the first thing to want to mention is once you've organized and you've gone through the first four steps of lean um, with the 5S, is make sure it is now defined as a new standard. What you've put into place, this is now what it should be, and this is the new standard. Now, how do you implement and reinforce this new standard is ideas would be maintaining, having a policy or standardizing the vials that are purchased so that this would be what would be continuously purchased over time. Also, doing monthly audits, reviewing your waste, par levels, or usage to help ensure that no changes need to be made, anything needs to be optimized, ensuring that what we've put into place is working. The other thing I recommend is to physically see your refrigerator units, because again, as I mentioned, you never know what you'll find once you open it up. Great, thank you. The, the next question um, relates to medical grade refrigeration. Okay. And, and the question is, do you use a, a strategy um, to introduce medical grade refrigeration um, to assist with patient safety? And I think what the, the question is getting at is, um, how do you, you know, position medical grade safety as far as the investment requires um, to support your patient safety initiatives? Yeah, so that's a great question as well. And so this particular question, I def when I've been looking at it within my organization, and while this presentation didn't really talk about temperatures, um, I do say that this is a really hard, a really good selling point with medical grade refrigeration is it really does help to decrease temperature fluctuations and so that you'll be able to ensure that your products are going to expire when they should. So let's say, for example, a vaccine had a temperature excursion, and then we have a new expiration date. But this new expiration date wasn't caught by the person who is the nurse who's administering this. And we actually end up administering a, a vaccine that's expired. But the, when it comes to vaccines, this should be a one-time you know, administration. Let's say MMR. This is supposed to last you for life. And this is why the potency is so important to ensure that we have a good integrity product. So this is how I would tie in the fact of medical grade refrigeration. The other in making sure that we are able to safely give and administer vaccines or any medication. Also, when it comes to medical grade units, there's not the, um, what the crispers at the bottom of the fridge to store medications. You only have what is there, the shelves, to store your meds. So you wouldn't have as many 
lost medications in the fridge because they're not going to be in the crispers. Also, they'll be able to help organize these. Sometimes when it comes to the shelves, they might sometimes pull out, which help with being able to um, safely be able to see the different medications within the fridge. So those are ways I've been able to talk about medical grade units and being able within safety. So great question. Thanks. And um, looks like we have one one other question. Yeah. Um, uh, in the work that that you did at your facility, um, did you prioritize certain departments or locations for lean activity or improvement based on any specific criteria? Yeah, so one of the things that we were able to do was first looking at places that store high alert medications. So for those, so within the hospital, it was those that were storing neuromuscular blockers or insulin drips, so you saw ICUs. Within the ambulatory care side, those would be the, those would be the areas that are storing um, our vaccine for children, um, our state supply, or as well as those are carrying um, very unique vaccines. Those are the ones that we focused on first. I understand that time is very valuable. So that would be a good place to start in prioritizing for different locations. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to, to thank everyone on our call today for participating in our webinar. Um, I'd also really like to thank Dr. Henny um, for sharing uh, this great presentation, great information. Uh, please use the email address um, that's gonna pop up on the screen. Uh, if you would like to contact our Helmer sales or technical services team, if you can advance the slide, please. Um, there you go. Uh, if you'd like to contact us, use the emails that you see on the screen. If you have any feedback or comments you would like to share about our webinar program, uh, please feel free to reach out directly to me at bgreenfield at helmerinc.com uh, or use Dr. Henney's email as listed on the slide. All registrants of this webinar will receive a survey as well. We do appreciate any feedback you can provide to help us continuously approve our programs. And we also hope to follow up on our event today with additional webinars with topics that are directly based on, on your feedback and requests. Uh, so with that, again, I'd like to thank Dr. Henney, and this concludes today's programs. Uh, thanks again.